Great to be back home. And let's just see here if we are on. Everything is working. Let's see, new faces. And see young faces of past years. Because none of us are getting older. If we live forever, we have no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. Uh, one person put it this way, the only way to get more of eternity is to start sooner. So we're just grateful. It's always a blessing to be here. Looking forward to seeing you. Um, I am sorry about the deaths and sickness, but on this world, even though we like to not get older, and in the scheme of things of eternity, we can say we're not. Yet Paul said, our physical body is growing weaker, even if our spiritual body, our spiritual uh, life is strengthening. Let's just uh, bow our heads for uh, one additional word of prayer and uh, see if I can get everything here. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll bless everything that's said. Uh, we want to be your people. We want to have Jesus' love in our hearts. We want to have the Holy Spirit fall. And uh, that's um, why we're here. And I pray that as we hear your word, we can actually hear the tone of voice of Jesus from himself, not from humans. And speak to us this morning. We thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Life was different before cell phones. In my academy dorm to contact us, the monitor at the front desk would make an announcement for everyone to hear over the PA system. He might say, Phil Mills, please come to the front desk. You have a visitor. Or, Phil Mills, please come to the front desk for a message. When I went to college, our dorm communication system was a little better. It was more advanced and private because there was a buzzer system and, and uh, it was right in your room. And one buzz meant call the front desk for a message. Two buzzes meant go to the lobby, a guest is waiting to see you. And three buzzes meant go to the phone at the end of the hall because you have a phone message. When I got to medical school, it was more advanced still. On the hospital uh, wards, we carried beepers. Wherever we were, we could be beeped. And as they got more advanced, the beeper would flash a phone number to call. But then cell phones changed everything. We are now continuously connected with the world around us. This gave us individualized, private, real-time communication. A cell phone constantly sends out signals, constantly listens for replies from the cell phone company. The phone network is continuously sending out signals and listening for replies right here in this room. Uh, signals are going back and forth all the time, constantly. Cell phones and cell phone networks are designed to remain in constant communication because of a constant connection. Now, when we go up the ACOE, we lose some connection. And if we didn't have our GPS beforehand, um, it wouldn't know how to direct us. What an advantage this constant communication, this constant connection gives for guidance when traveling. 
Our cell phones are not only connected with cell towers, they're connected with satellites. So in a real sense, we can say they're connected with heaven. In real time, our phone even acts as a GPS, giving us directions. In the spring, we turned on the GPS to find a, an address in Chattanooga. We didn't know it was some uh, uh, store, and we didn't know exactly where it was, but we knew it was in Chattanooga somewhere. So we, uh, we put in the address, and we started following the GPS. Now I know enough how to get to Chattanooga, since we lived there, that um, it became apparent that the directions the GPS was telling us made no sense. Um, it told us to make a wrong turn. It would actually lengthen our trip. And so I knew better than the GPS. I ignored the instructions. Um, and it seemed right until we got to a bridge that had an accident and uh, no way through. It had been giving us a better way than we ourselves knew. We should have trusted the GPS instead of our own knowledge and experience. Like cell phone companies, God has a communication network that includes a GPS that is connected with heaven. Isaiah 30, 21, read it with me. Your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Am I in people's way? Because I can get out of the way. The Bible has numerous illustrations of this heavenly GPS system. Speaking of Paul's small medical evangelistic team, the Bible says, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. This is God's heavenly GPS rerouting. And Paul and his company did not do what they did and did not do what I did and simply ignore the direction change. After they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Once again, the heavenly GPS rerouted their expected course and its destination. So passing by Mysia, they came to, down to Troas. Now, I don't know why God's heavenly GPS system rerouted them. Perhaps it was to confuse Satan, who had arranged for an attack in Asia and Bithynia, that would have destroyed the mission altogether. Perhaps there was an infectious disease or an accident. We'll find out in heaven. But what I do know is that there is a way that seems right to a man. There's a way that seemed right to Paul and Luke and his fellow team members. It seemed right to go to Asia. It seemed right to go to Bithynia, but its end is the way of death, death to our vision, perhaps death to a mission. And Christians can gain all the guidance they need for God has promised. You will call, the Lord will answer you. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. The Lord will guide you continually. Do you like that promise? Amen. We need this guidance not only for maximal efficiency on our mission, but also for maximal success in our assigned task. To receive heaven's guidance, we have to have a connection with heaven. To get and stay connected. To cell phones to do this have a handshaking protocol. Handshaking is a process that establishes a communication between a network and the device connected to it. This handshaking protocol keeps you connected and assures reliable communication. Each cell phone and each network has a handshaking protocol. And these protocols are necessary for constant, secure, reliable connection. 
this also individualizes the communication. And that's how T-Mobile phones recognize T-Mobile networks and ignore Verizon si uh, <laughs> signals. And this is how two Verizon customers can stand side by side, but only one receives a phone call going through a specific network to a specific phone. And just as T-Mobile and Verizon have a very specific handshaking protocol, Heaven's Communication has a handshaking protocol to establish a constant connection that's both secure, reliable, and individualized. I found that connection with Heaven is a theme running throughout the inspired writings. Now, um, I'm going to just have a stop for a moment and just have a little activity here. Um, what is the protocol for connection with heaven that enables us to hear the voice of God? So just right around you, people that are right around you, I'm going to give you uh, one minute to uh, discuss, and, uh, and then I want to hear your responses. So here we are. What is the protocol for connection with heaven that enables us to hear the voice of God? One minute. Thirty seconds, or do you need any more? Are you ready? There's still some discussion. Fifteen seconds. Everything's getting quiet, though. So we'll just stop it now. Um, what are uh, what is the protocol, the handshaking protocol for connection with heaven? Prayer, Bible study, Holy Spirit impressing us, belief, faith, the Holy Spirit is the channel. Notice this, and you've all been including this, those who will devote some time every day to meditation and prayer and to the study of the scriptures will be, read it with me, connected with heaven and will have a saving, transforming influence upon those around them. Now this is so packed, let's just repeat it together again so we can see how it lo looks. Those who will devote some time every day to meditation, prayer, and to the study of the scriptures will be what? Connected with heaven and will have a saving, transforming influence upon those around them. Do you want a saving, transforming influence about the, uh, 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 on those around you? It only comes if we are connected with heaven. And how are we connected with heaven? Sometime every day, Meditation, prayer, study of the scriptures. Whenever we study inspired writings, we should always try to see how God personalizes the passage for us. Where are you mentioned in this verse, in this passage? What two groups are mentioned or implied in this passage? The group specifically mentioned is the group consisting of those who will. Can anyone be part of this group? Whosoever will. Does this passage mention any other group? Yes, though not mentioned, it is implied. If there are some who will, there must be others who won't. And these two groups encompass the world, whosoever will and whosoever won't. What includes or excludes us from connection with heaven? our choice. 
Those who are connected with heaven choose to be. This is an act of choice. Those who do not make this choice are consenting not to be connected with heaven. That's a default choice. When you take a test and don't fill out an answer, you made a choice. Today, this is youth instructor. Today, angels are leading and guiding those who, read it with me, will be led and guided. Who are angels guiding? Who gets the GPS? Whosoever will. Those who will be led and guided. We may have a picture of a satellite on this page, but this is not rocket science. Every one of us can choose to be in the honorably mentioned group. Every one of us can be in the group that's connected with heaven. Every one of us can be in the group that has a powerful influence for God and for good on our associates. Is there a third group somewhere between those who will and those who won't? No, no third group. My dad frequently repeated the following paragraph from Desire of Ages, and I found it very helpful. We must inevitably be under the control of the one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. Inevitably. It is not necessary for us deliberately to choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its dominion. It's the default choice. We have only to, what's that next word? Neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. And then the next sentence is one of the most important sentences in the entire book of Desire of Ages. Unless we become vitally connected with God, the word vital comes from a Latin word for life. Nurses take vital signs, that is, signs for life. A vital connection means there's a life to the connection. It's a living connection. And we are naturally se separated from God. Not long ago, our church sponsored an interesting class evening on grafting branches into fruit trees and vines. Without the grafting, Branches cut from the stock will quickly shrivel and die. And the only way when you get a graft from some company, horticultural company or farming com company, fruit farming company, they'll send you a branch. And the only way for that branch to make fruit is if it is grafted into the stock. Without this, the branch will quickly shrivel and die. And the only way there can be a living connection is through grafting. Our grandparents can be committed Christians. Our parents can be committed. Our spouse can be committed. Our pastor can be committed. The elders can be committed. But unless we ourselves have a living connection with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love can't happen. Self-indulgence and temptation to sin. Isn't that pretty powerful? Unless vitally connected, we can, how often? Never resist unhallowed effects of temptation to sin. You have trouble resisting? It's the connection that we need. That's why our topic is so important. It is this vital connection that gives us victory in our spiritual life, enabling us to resist besetting sins. The next sentence expounds on this and reveals how to avoid being confused. We may leave off many bad habits. For the time, we may part company with Satan. But is leaving off many bad habits good? Yes, but. Is parting company with Satan essential? Yes, but. Without a vital connection with God, there's that phrase, vital connection again. How do we gain that vital connection? It continues. Through the surrender of ourselves to him 
moment by moment. That's the heavenly handshaking protocol. A moment by moment surrender to what we've read, what we've meditated on, and what we have prayed about in our morning and evening devotions. We shall be overcome. The word shall, um, we have Rudy here. Is there a difference between will and shall in legal documents, Rudy, or am I wrong on that? Shall is what? Yeah. It's, a, it's a certainty, it's a command. We shall do this. Yeah. In life, we will either be victors or vanquished. When we either have a moment by moment surrender, we have a vital connection and we receive strength to overcome. Or we choose our own way and have only our own strength and that is insufficient to bring us lasting victory. The choice is ours to make. And then the passage contains the secret of the victors, the directions for being grafted. This is the directions to be in the group of overcomers that are mentioned in Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three. Notice how the next sentence expands on how to have this vital connection. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion. This is a secret. A personal acquaintance with Jesus. Our precious friend, we know him as a friend and a constant companion. And he is with us and we're constantly communicating uh, to, with him. He's constantly talking to us. But without this, we are at the mercy of the enemy. How much mercy does the enemy have? <laughs> and shall do his bidding in the end. This is the ungrafted branch without a living connection. Its leaves turn brown and fall off, its fruit shrivels and it dies. And dear folk, this is what God does not want for one person here to have this morning. He wants us not to be branches, members that are just branches, but separated from Jesus. He wants us to be branches that are grafted into Jesus. This is describing in detail the problem of the stony ground here in Christ's parable of the sower. Notice this from uh, uh, manuscript 131, 1903. Many of those whose names are on the church books are stony ground hearers. This is many. And what's a stony ground here? You remember that? They shrivel up and die. They get a little heat. They get a little uh, issues. And um, their Christianity goes away. But many... They're in the church books. They seem to be Christians, but the Christian life they are living is done in their own strength without a living connection to heaven. They're not grafted into the vine, Jesus. Without this, how much fruit can they produce? None. They will ultimately wash out at the end. And during times of testing, they'll be shaken out, overcome, by Satan and doing his bidding. We can fool people today. A deciduous tree during the summer looks green, but when the cold of winter comes on, then you find out who the evergreens are. And everyone here is going to be revealed if we live long enough, our Christianity or absence of it. They will leave and join the ranks of the enemy. Every Christian without a living connection with God, every Christian who fails to surrender himself to God moment by moment will sooner or later be exposed as a fraud. Every one of us will be tested to stand in defense of truth and righteousness, 5T136. When the majority forsake us, this will be our test. If it is the majority who forsake us from the church, those who are connected with heaven must be in the minority. Jesus talks about this group again and again. 
These are not only stony ground hearers, they are also foolish virgins in Christ's parable of the 10 virgins. These are not only the foolish virgins, but they are the foolish builder of the parable of the wise and foolish home builder. These are not only the foolish builder, but they are the bad fish of the parable of the net. These are also represented by the hypocrite son that said, but didn't do in Christ's parable of the two sons. By these and other illustrations, Jesus has pointed out the dangers of this group that are the Laodiceans of Revelation 3. But the good news is that we as Laodiceans can repent and become Philadelphians with a vital connection with God that makes us overcomers, with a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion, no longer at the mercy of Satan, their enemy, no longer going to do his bidding at the end. But this brings us back to our focus passage. Those who will devote some time every day to meditation and prayer and to the study of the scriptures will be connected with heaven. Habitual meditation, prayer, and Bible study plugs us in to the source of power. This makes us as much part of the team of heaven as the angels. In fact, we're the angels' extension. We go where heaven would have us go, where we are needed. Just as the angels know where to go, we can know where to go. We are labors together with God, Paul says. And this is because devoting daily time to meditation, prayer, and Bible not only connects us with heaven, but it connects us with men. For it gives us a saving, transforming influence upon those around us. So let's examine this protocol more closely. Sometimes we speak of having our devotions. The term simply means we devote some time to personal Bible study, prayer, and meditation. It is not possible to have personal Bible study, prayer, and meditation without devoting time to it. And that's called devotions. How much time do we need to devote to get connected with heaven? What does it say? Some time. Why doesn't God give us a specific amount of time? Five minutes, 10 minutes, three hours. It says, what does it say? Some time. Because it depends. It varies. One day we may need more time than another day. But whether it is longer or shorter at any given day, it should be some time. The first item in Heaven's Connection Protocol is to devote some time. But how often should we devote some time to meditation, prayer, and Bible study? <laughs> Every day. Regardless of the circumstances, we devote some amount of time without fail every day to meditation, prayer, and study of scriptures. This is what Paul was talking about when he said, Pray without ceasing. It is not merely we're uh, saying the rosary 24 hours a day. It means that without fail, we're having time with God in prayer, consistent daily prayer. We do this daily without fail. This is not a one-way communication like my Academy PA system. This is a two-way connection. We talk to him in prayer. God talks to us through his word and as we meditatively review it during the day. And the only way to be sure we devote some time every day is to make sure this is the very first thing we do on awakening. But seek, what's the next word? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. You don't want to Start your day without guidance. You want the guidance from the first moment of your eye blinks open. Each day we devote 24 hours to various activities, sleep, eat, some school, work, but these may ne must never exclude time for meditation, prayer, and Bible study. What we spend our time thinking about and doing is the real indicator of our priorities. If we do not devote some time every day to meditation, prayer, 
and Bible study, we show that our connection with heaven is not our priority. Our primary desire, our highest interest, whatever we mount the church. William Penn once said, time is what we want most, but what we use worst. We may not always be able to control how we spend our time, but we can try to make the most of, how, of uh, our time. Some may say, I just wish I had more time. How much time would you want? Suppose God answered that wish, came down, and gave you a package of extra time. What would you use that time for? God is giving us a gift of time every day of life. I remember college. I got a number of monitoring type jobs so I could study at the same time I work. In essence, I got jobs that would pay me while I studied. And uh, I had a lot of hours of uh, work that way. Unfortunately, too often during my college years, I would think and procrastinate. Well, I have this time and I have more time here so I can study later. If God gave us more time, most of us, if we don't use the time he does give us, giving us more time would just be wasted as well. No wonder Moses prayed, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The prayer of Moses there in uh, Psalm 90, 12. If we are connected with heaven and guided by God, he will help us to use our time wisely. Notice Ministry of Healing 208. If every moment were valued and rightly employed, we should have time for everything that we need to do for ourselves or for the world. God's given us sufficient time. In the use of time, let every Christian look to God for guidance. So the first thing that God wants to give us in our connection with heaven is how we can best use our time that he's given us. God has given us a special bonus of time in the Sabbath so that we have a whole day to spend with him. This gives us more time to meditate, pray, and study the Bible. But if we don't devote no time to meditation, prayer, and study the word, if we selfishly keep that time without thought of God, we are declaring that God has no part of our life and we are uninterested in having a connection with heaven. Ultimately, like the cave fish that's never exposed to light and loses its ability to see, we lose our ability and desire to connect with heaven. Perhaps you heard the story of Ryan Bell, the former pastor in California who decided to try a very public experiment and live without God for a year. Heard of him? For a year, he wouldn't pray. For a year, he wouldn't study or meditate on the Bible. For a year, he would not go to church. During that year, he blogged about his experiment. And uh, the first month, his wife divorced him. Um, and he lost his job. Yet none of this turned him to God. It only stiffened his resolve and hardened him. Like those who are suffering under the judgments of the seven last plagues, he blasphemed the name of God and did not repent to give him the glory. Could he have done this year without God if he had all not already been spending years without God? After this year-long experiment without God, he decided he didn't need God and announced himself an atheist, and he remains an atheist to this day. But many who condemned this man about his going without God were themselves unconnected, but unconscious that they were unconnected. Do you devote some time every day to meditation, prayer, and a study of the scriptures? Or do you too have days in your life without God. Being constantly connected with heaven provides real-time guidance, warning of dangers ahead that those without God do not have. Meditation and prayer and Bible study is actually a repeating cycle. Meditation will cause us to pray, which prepares us for Bible study, which gives us subject matter for meditation. And it works in any direction. Meditation drives us to Bible study, which 
takes us to prayer. And this repeats throughout the day. Let's look more closely at meditation. There's a pagan meditation with its opening of the mind to satanic influence. We're not talking about this. But what is biblical meditation? I'm going to give you uh, just a, a moment. Um, discuss it with yourselves for just a few seconds here. And uh, what does it, what is biblical meditation? You want to talk to each other and uh, give, it to, give it to us? What is meditation? Biblical. What does that mean? Yeah, 27 seconds. Five seconds. All right. What is Biblical meditations. Wait, oh, uh, Mark. Mark. Yeah, so uh, focusing on God's word, listening for that still small voice, so drowning out distraction. All right, good. What's uh, other people, what did you decide meditation is? Can you think of a synonyms or words you could use to substitute? The sound of silence. Oh, tell me. You know, at the beginning of the Sabbath school lesson, it, it talks about reading that chapter out loud. I read the Bible out loud all the time because it has helped me tremendously this last year. Reading out loud. Uh, yes, and, uh, and so it involves your ears, not just your eyes. It involves your mouth. It's good. Well, here's some words. There are a lot of synonyms. Think about, contemplate, consider, give thought to, mull over, muse, ponder, cogitate on, dwell on, chew on, turn over in one's mind. This is all what the, th the source said meditation is. Meditation is illustrated by those animals that chew the cud. After a cow eats grass, it will be regurgitated and chewed again, furthering the digestive process. This book of the law shall not what? Depart from your mouth. Where was the book of the law not to depart? Where to chew on it? You could substitute a synonym for meditate, such as you shall meditate on it, to dwell on it, or any of those uh, muse, ponder, cogitate. Um, and what happens when we do this? That you may observe to do uh, according to all that is written in it. Meditation brings practical understanding of how to apply God's message to our lives, how to use it in a conversation. Meditation is what makes the Bible guide us in what we do or don't do. Meditation occurs throughout the day and keeps us connected with heaven, and we do um, right, which will influence others. The only way we can meditate on God's word is to memorize the words, learn them by heart. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, learn them by heart. Now, of course, not departing from our mouths has other meanings besides chewing on it. Our mouths not only chew, but they not only put in, but speak. After we memorize a passage, we will forget without review. And how do we review? You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. We influence people by what they see us do and also by what they hear us say. That's comes as a result of meditation. Man's words, CT 423, if of any value, do what? Echo the words of God. It is not only what we say, it includes how we say it, the tones of our voices, the expression of our countenances. King Charles III was, watching close, was, was watched closely during the coronation. And while he was waiting in a carriage with Camilla, Cameras caught the expression on his face and lip readers were able to determine what he was saying, his impatient words, his frustrating words, his saying, this is boring. Just as kings are watched, we are watched. 
More than words come out of our mouths, songs come out as well. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is all part of a solid, continuous connection with heaven. And what is the result of this type of meditation? For then you'll make your way prosperous. And then you'll have good success. There are a number of ways this is translated. Only then will you prosper in your undertakings, and only then will you be successful, one translation. We've looked at meditation, the blessing it brings to our lives. Let's briefly, we're almost done, turn our attention to prayer, another part of Heaven's Connection Protocol. The Bible associates prayer with power. Acts 4.31, and when they prayed, the place where they assembled together was what? Shaken. This power was no less available 1,500 years later. The power that shook the building shook the world. From the secret place of prayer came the power that shook the world. And that power remains available today. No wonder David exclaimed, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. We all know the story of Daniel's habit of praying multiple times a day. Several times each day, precious golden moments should be consecrated to prayer. This is particularly true in the major epochs of our life. You remember what this says, if men and women are in the habit of praying twice a day before they contemplate marriage, what should they do? Double it, four times a day when such a step is anticipated. What is a habit? This means that they're already praying people. Does it take time and practice to form a habit? If they already have that habit, praying twice a day, um, then they're ready to contemplate marriage. But if they don't have a habit of praying twice a day, probably they're not somebody you should be dating. If you're single, what should be one of the first items on a single individual's list of qualifications for a future spouse? Do they have a habit of prayer? Houses and riches are inheritance from fathers. There are some things you can get from parents or others, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. We all know that even a prophet as wise as Samuel couldn't make the right choice for a king. Hiring people. God had to tell him, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We want more than in our dealing with other people. We need a God who can look within their hearts while we can only see the outward appearance and the outward words. Oh, we already saw this. Oh, I'm going to skip a couple things. Brings us back to Bible study. We just looked at this quote several times each day. Precious golden moments should be consecrated to prayer. Now, let's look at what's contained in the rest of the quote. To prayer and the study of the scriptures. If it is only to commit a text to memory, that spiritual life may exist in the soul. Precious moments every day. The expression spiritual life is synonymous with a vital connection, a living connection. That's what gives spiritual power. And those who will devote some time every day to meditation and prayer and to the study of the scripture will be connected with heaven. This connection protects us from the dangerous minefields that surround us. It's like antivirus software in your computer. If the youth are connected with heaven, they will be able to discern evil from good and to penetrate the specious appearance with which vice hides its hideousness. That's what our young people need. Connection with heaven gives us the whole armor of God that enables us to both recognize and withstand the wiles of Satan. And this also is what surrounds us with an atmosphere of heaven, like the fragrant lily above the dirty pond. That atmosphere will influence all who come close enough to breathe its fragrance. <clears throat> Paul carried with him throughout his life on earth the very 
atmosphere of heaven. All who associated with him felt the influence of his connection with Christ and the companionship with angels. But the greatest example of connection with heaven is not Paul, it's Jesus. And we want to close this study by looking at Jesus. The early morning often found him in some secluded place, Ministry of Healing says, meditating, searching the scriptures, or in prayer. What was Jesus' example? Secluded place, early morning, meditating, searching the scriptures, praying. We could say he was devoting some time, the first time of his day, to meditation, searching the scriptures, or praying. Jesus started his day connecting with heaven. Like the example of the birds with the voices singing, he welcomed the morning light. With songs of thanksgiving, he cheered his hours of labor and brought heaven's gladness to the toil-worn and disheartened. Is it your desire this morning to be like Jesus? Connected with heaven by constant surrender, not my will, but thine be done. Is it your desire to have a consistent connection, not a fitful on-again, off-again experience with God? If this is your desire, will you sing with me the closing prayer? It's a song, but it's a prayer. I need thee every hour, hymn 483.